Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. For all my Love Your Story listeners, you know the premise of the podcast is that we are living our life story. While our backstories may be messy, coming to love and accept them is crucial to self-love and to moving forward in a healthy way. We are also constantly talking about the fact that since our lives are an unfolding story and we have agency and we have intellect, we can, if we choose, and if we choose is the key there, control that story. We can shift directions at any time. We understand that the stories we tell ourselves determine what we believe, how we see the world, how we see ourselves. And those are powerful things because they in turn determine our very lives. So the first question I want to ask is, do you get this in theory or do you really understand that power and put it into action? On today's show, I have Mary Alice Arthur, a woman who has spent her life as a story activist, helping people to understand this concept and to empower them to use this power that we all have. She's the author of 365 Alive, Find Your Voice, Claim Your Story, Live Your Brilliant Life. And she has traveled the world, going in and out of organizations and systems and cultures, working with groups and individuals, helping them realize that story is our secret superpower of humanity. So stay tuned. It's going to be a great interview as we get some nuggets of wisdom from her. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm excited for our future together of telling stories evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story power serves you best when you know how to use it. to my question, do we really get the superpower that we have within the story that we're living? Or, you know, do we use the superpower with intention? I want to share a personal example of, you know, right now as a realtor in the realtor market in Utah, in the real estate market, it's really hard on buyers. And I have five buyers that I'm working with right now. And I find myself telling this story because they're having to come in well above asking price and well above appraisal price and having earnest money go hard. And I find myself telling this story of about how difficult it is, how difficult it is to get their offers accepted, how difficult it is for them to get into anything. And while I really do see this as true, it's you know it's like a fact of the market. I think that me being aware here, if I focus on that negativity, I'm, I believe I'm going to get very different results than if I focus on a positive aspect. If I focus on what can we do to get this done? What can we do to focus on how can I positively take this offer forward to get it accepted? And so I'm in this with all of the rest of you. Maybe we're just starting to understand it. We have to practice it with things in real life. Well, If we really get it, we begin to use this to track the stories that we're telling ourselves and to tune into those, to determine which stories are lifting you, which ones are holding you back. That's where we're at. That's where we're starting at here is, first of all, we have to take stock of that from those stories, which ones support and empower us, becoming aware of that. So Mary Alice, she's going to teach us about this today. And today's show is particularly exciting because she knows more and has more insight and has dealt with these things actually in teaching people and helping them embrace this power that lies within our minds and spirits. So let's, let's talk to her. Let's, let's get the how to Mary Alice. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for the invitation, Lori. Really lovely to be with you here. Thank you. I want to start with a quote from you. You said, quote, the stories you tell yourself influence, whether you feel powerless or powerful color, how you define success and happiness. Underpin eerie action, every, a typo on my part, every action you take. When you wake up to the stories that, that at work for you in your life, you suddenly step into the position of power. Story stops being what defines you and becomes your ally. Tell me about that quote. Have you ever felt like 
let me, let me tell a story actually that will illustrate this. And there's this old quote about, I walked down a road, there was a hole in the street and I fell into it. Ugh. I walked next day, chapter two. I walk down the same road. The hole is still there. I fall into it. I think to myself, not again. I get myself out. Day three. I, now, now this time I see the hole coming. Somehow I still managed to fall into it, but at least I saw it coming. Chapter four. I walk down a different road. So that's kind of an old story. And when the pandemic began, I work, you say you're working as a realtor. I'm also a host and a facilitator. So I do a lot of group work, working with teams, working with organizations. And there are some patterns that you get to notice after a while. And I, in, when the pandemic began, a colleague of mine had this idea to run this conference. So I, I kind of, I don't know, off the top of my head said yes. And I found it was like 90 hours of input later when I was feeling like I was doing a whole lot for this project. And he finally, he said to me at one moment, well, are you going to attend this meeting? And I said, sure, um, but I don't exactly know what to say. And he said, well, you could just then be quiet then, you know. And I found myself, my inner child was totally like up in arms because being told you could just be quiet, you know, really brought my, my kind of inner warrior up. And we managed to move through that place where I could tell that what I was being was a reflection of what he was being. And then he wanted to do something else. And suddenly I found I had joined the ship again. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've fallen into the hole again. <laughs> How did this happen? And somebody, I was working with somebody at the, that point in time, I was in a group and this person had offered us all images to choose from. And I saw an image that totally sparked my curiosity. It was a person in a place like New York City, one of those big urban places. And they were in a hole of water about really right up to their nose. And I looked at that picture and I went, that's me. That's me in this story that I just found myself in. And I realized, oh my goodness, I keep falling into this hole. And then I had a shift of perception. How do I take this story and make it something different? And I told myself this word, keep falling into the hole. And I realized the hole was W-H-O-L-E. How do I keep falling into the hole? So the more I can take awareness of what's around me, the more I can listen to my own inner voice of intuition, which is, is so right. And so often later on, I go, should I listen to that little voice that told me to not do that? Uh, but how do I keep reminding myself to keep falling into the hole? And that's how I totally shifted the paradigm of that story. And I realized that this, this conflict with the, this other person had been the gift in disguise when I shifted my story about it. So you shifted it from H-O-L-E to W-H-O-L-E. Yes. So this is called flipping the script. How do I flip the script on some old stories? So another one is, you know, my, my mother grew up with a terrible story of loss because her mother died in a flu epidemic. Does that sound similar? Um, in the 30s. And she was about five. And her sister died in a plane crash. Plane fell out of a bright blue sky in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, her father was gone. Her entire family was gone. So she had this ongoing story of loss. And she was telling it to me yet again as we were driving somewhere. She was driving. I was in the passenger seat. And I said to her, Mom, I kind of was like, hey, you know what? Can I invite you to also look and see that the story of your life has made you the strong person you are, the person who is sensitive to other people, the person who is making a difference? And there was a tension in the car, you know, like I think she gripped the steering wheel <laughs> tightly. And I, I thought for a moment she was going to put me out on the street. But later on, I heard her saying, I realized that my life has strength in it. So she had suddenly picked up this flip of the script. And, you know, so when you narrate your own story in a different way, it takes you to a different place. I think the first thing that we need to do, the first step for all of this, as each of us individually, is to become aware of what those stories are. And sometimes, mm -hmm. like with your your mother, you had to point that out to her. There was no other concept at that point besides loss that she was considering. And so to be able yeah. to say, um, you know, consider this. I love the way you said that. It was very tactful. I invite you to see this also. I think that reframing of 
a story. In fact, this is really what Love Your Story was created on was the space where I got to where I had to reframe all my past stories. And I could see the power in that. It changed my trajectory moving forward because it changed how I saw my past. This is a big deal. So for the listeners, look at honestly and openly, what stories are you telling yourself? And while they seem like fact, how do you shift that? And Mary Alice, my question to you would be, how do you help people understand the subjectiveness of story? The easiest way to think about it is to think about being in a meeting or a group, maybe a family dinner, maybe around a a meeting table in in the workplace. If you if you do that kind of thing recently (laughs) on Zoom together with other people, you're all experiencing the same space time event, this meeting, this gathering, whatever it is. But you'll notice that out of the five people who are experiencing that event, every one of them has a different perception of what happened. So somebody might say, how dare she? And another one might say, well, it's about time she spoke up. (laughs) And a third one might say, what the heck just happened? So so true. (laughs) Yeah. And so right there, that's a practical demonstration that we all are creating meaning out of our, our reality in every moment. You know, sometimes I think, do I recall family stories because I saw a photograph and people told me about it? Or do I actually remember it? And I happen to have a sister who's got one of these kind of not photographic memory, but multicolor memory. And she'll tell me a memory she has. And I'll look at her sometimes and say, was I there? (laughs) I do that with my sister all the time. I'm like, we grew up in the same house. We're only a year apart, but you had a totally different reality than I had. Exactly. And that's, that's the truth of it. You said it right there, Laurie, that we can grow up in the same house. We can grow up in the same culture. We can grow up with the same parents and we're carrying a different story because of how we made sense and meaning of it. Absolutely. So So once we realize that as people, that stories are subjective, that our interpretations of any given event is subjective and we can admit admit Mm -hmm. that it's not fact, then we get to do that work of how do I, how do I embrace a more empowering story? How do I embrace a more, a story that supports me better and what I'm trying to accomplish, you know, let's take the the real estate example I used earlier. Me sitting mm-hmm. here and bitching about the market is <laughs> just keeps me in this negative swirl. I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure that the energy around me has some effect because of that story. So how do I tell a different story that focuses on better aspects of that? And I think that's something that um, we all need to do as we take stock of what are the negative stories we're we're sharing, right? Yeah. So if I think about your real estate, it's that that case of, okay, things are challenging out there, but am I committed to these people enough that we're in this kind of hero's journey together? I'm going to help them find a place. It may be challenging, but we are going to make it and they're going to be satisfied. I'm just going to love up on them. <laughs> you know? I like so, that. And I, I like, yeah, calling it the, uh, the hero's journey because, you know, it feels like such a rolly tur- toss turvy adventure to, to get it done. But it is because this is an interesting thing. What is their story of home? That would Mm. be a fascinating thing to find out. As a realtor, I'd be really interested in not what are you interested in on the house, but what is your concept of home? Because that says something to me about the story you want to live into, for which I'm going to find you a physical location. But it's a story we're stepping into together, actually. Mm. And we all have different perceptions of home, right? Yeah, I was going to say, and everybody's is different. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when I read the Harry Potter books, I would always think, you know, why doesn't Harry study harder? Like it was always Hermione that was studying, right? And trying to do things. And if you knew that you had the kind of power he was supposed to have, that you were the chosen one, like why wouldn't you just like really knuckle down and figure out how to use that, really practice? But in real life, you know, we kind of do have that kind of superpower. We have amazing power and few of us actually take the time and the effort to tap into it. And I feel like the story, the power of story is one of those things, Um, unless you're pressured to like, you're in so much pain that you just have to reframe a story so you can make it happen. It becomes, you know, something that you, yeah, I could figure that out, but truly the power of story can shift 
our and complete life experience. What exercises do you have that you have used with your groups that really start helping people take control of their stories? Do you have any of those you could share? Well, first, I want to just go back to the story of Harry. Dear okay. Harry, okay. <laughs> the, the, the boy who survived. But, you know, until you hit the challenge, and he'd been in a challenge most of his life, he'd been there under the stairs. So he was kind of forced, almost forced into the basement, you know. So does that give you a lot of motivation to, to, to try harder? It kind of gives you that, oh, my goodness, I'm allowed to go here first. I mean, that's the start of the story, isn't it? So an important thing to realize is the geography of a story. And to know that it was a, it was a perfect day isn't actually a, a great story because there's not a challenge in it. We don't, our, our human neuro system is not set up to pay attention to it was a beautiful day our whole setup is about but wait <laughs> guess what happened then we're right. like whoop, we're into it because we think we can learn something from it so it's interesting to understand the geography of a story which of course we all know very simple beginning middle and end and there are three different parts to every part of the story too because the beginning has a beginning a middle and end to it the middle has a beginning, middle, and end. So knowing where you are in the story will help you know something about what you're facing. And the interesting thing about any human life is that we are a story field. It's like we're an intersection of all these stories we're part of. So you're, you're a, a realtor. You're um, somebody who's podcasting. You're a partner to somebody. You're in community. All of these are intersecting stories about who you are, and all of them are in different places. So some stories are at the beginning, and at the beginning, there's this curiosity, this wonder, this kind of opening. So, you know, Harry first coming to, to Hogwarts is, is the beginning of a, of a much broader trajectory through which he will be honed in the end to step up to his destiny, but there's twists and turns in the middle. So the beginning is where we're curious about stuff, and the best thing we can do when something's beginning is to be even more curious because then you're more flexible, then there's more opportunity in your storyline. If you desperately want something to be some way, I'm gonna go on this dating app and find the love of my life. They're gonna look exactly like this square box I have decided. You're probably gonna have a challenge because you're at the beginning of the story, but you're not letting it, there's no latitude for the story to unfold. Mm. In the middle of a story is the time when confusion and chaos and Complica I'm naming all C words, complication and conflict and all that kind of stuff happens. So I can expect that if I'm in a good story, there's going to be some of that, that I will be at the point where I think, I don't know what the heck is going on. I feel like I'm in the fog. Can I leave the room? Can I go home? <laughs> can I go home now? <laughs> yeah. There's well, going to you know, be that. You, you know what I love about what you just said is this idea of we think that when we're if we're in, if we're in a good story, that it should be a beautiful day, you know, that, I mean, just our humanness, it's like, oh, if this is a good yeah. story, then um, my love life is unfolding as I think it should. And my career is unfolding as I think it should. And that, you know, that's the good story. That's the life we want. That's the ease we want. So I love that you said the idea that right now, wherever you're at in that mm. story, the beginning, the middle, the end, and all the beginnings, middles, yeah. and ends that are mixed together for you, that there are going to be times of confusion. There are going to be those times of conflict. There are going to be those times of severe disappointment, even failure, all of those things that we think shouldn't be there if it's a good story. But the truth of it is that those things will be there if it's a good story. And so while people are judging their own life stories and finding shame or finding acceptance or, you know, finding dissatisfaction, finding the disappointment, you know, it's all okay. It's all part of that process yeah. of, of living a good story. It's all going to be in there. I remember working with, a, I was on a hosting team in, in Sweden. We had a multinational hosting team for an event of about a hundred people. And one of the young guys who was there, a young Dutch guy, he, uh, he said, I don't know what's going on. I just feel like I'm 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 in the fog. I can't tell what's happening. I don't even know what my feelings are. And another young guy put his hand on his shoulder and said, "Dude, you're in learning." <laughs> I love that. You're in learning. You know, let yourself have this a bit of a confusion moment because you know how the mind is made up. It's like it's like all of our stories are puzzle pieces fitted together. And when a new piece comes flying in, 
one of a couple things happen. Either number one, you go, oh, this fits on the edge, boom, and you just put it there. Number two, you go, wait a second, I don't like this piece, and you defend against it, or you don't even see it as you're as it's flying by because you're not open enough to see it. Life is continually asking you to add new puzzle pieces to your map, but it mm. depends on whether you're open to it or not. And the middle of a story is when the new puzzle pieces are flying in. When you feel like I want to defend myself against this because I don't like it or it freaks me out, uh, I can't even see it like that story's not true or it's not happening because I don't know it's happening. And we're having that around race and around social justice and around mm. equity and all of those kind of things because there are those of us who don't want to see it or we haven't experienced it so it's not real for us somehow. Right. You know, can we be open enough to receive the gift of the new puzzle piece? And so the question in the middle is, what kind of practice do I have to keep me grounded so I can stay open? And that brings me back to that question of, do you have any exercises or practices that allow us to do that, either to be more aware of the stories we're telling or allow us that fluidity to accept other puzzle pieces? What's a What's a go-to that we can take with us that helps us to do this? I mean, an easy one is really a story a day. And I don't mean a a novella. I'm just meaning a one-page story. Like you might give yourself a prompt and the prompt might be parents or the prompt might be home or the prompt might be work and just write yourself a story about that. What's the first thing that comes to your head? So what you're doing with that is you're priming the pump. We are full of stories, as brain scientists would say, if they're having a brain operation and they touch the brain, you know, every part of the brain has all that you've ever experienced in it. But because there's so much of it, we can't find it usually. Like if I stood next to you and I said, tell me everything you know about such and such, you might not be able to for a couple of reasons. Number one, I might just surprise the heck out of you or you find me scary. Number two, there's no context to find the content. That's why a good question or a good prompt is helpful. And number three, you might not trust me with what you're about to say. So when you're with yourself and you're just going, all right, siblings, let me put the word siblings at the top of my page and just write a story about something that happened. I have two sisters, something that happened with one of my sisters or both of them. What I'm doing is inviting my brain to go to that place and find those things that are still in here in my mind that I haven't thought about or brought up for a long time. So I'm beginning to build the landscape and remind myself of the landscape of the stories that I'm in. The more I do that, the more they will arise suddenly. Like most of us are busy in front of the screen doing our stuff. We're not paying any attention to the material that's inside of us. It's like the 90% of the iceberg that's underneath the surface which is actually attuning us to perceive the world in a certain way, like the lens on a pair of glasses. Okay. So um, if you're trying to do story work for your own life, let's say Mm -hmm. you are, let's just take stick with the sibling thing. You're having problems with your siblings. That would be the time to use that prompt to sit down and write out what are those stories and then see if you could maybe perceive those stories from one of the siblings point of views or um, talk to them yeah. about it or find a way to, you know, change the landscape with that story. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Or you, you so number one, you're going into research for yourself. What is, what's making up my story field? Because all of my experiences of the past are, are influencing how I see right now. So how I deal sure. with authority, how I deal with, uns- and right now we're in still in uncertainty for most people, or I'll just raise my hand. I'm still in uncertainty. <laughs> been home alone for a long time. Uh, so I can ask myself, when in the past in my life have I experienced uncertainty? And start writing some of those stories to see how I responded. And to say, what are the gifts out of how I responded in the past? And where did I not respond so well? What can I learn from that? And am I doing any of that right now? Is mm-hmm. the little voice in my head telling me it's going to be bad like that again? So Writing stories helps us to realize where we've been and what the material is that's underneath the surface that's pushing us in certain ways. So that, number one, you know, in in my book, I've written a lot of exercises like that of saying, okay, think about your life as a fairy tale, but don't tell the fairy tale from the I point of view, from the first person, tell it from the third person, because when you can get some distance on your life, you can see it in a different way. 
That's most of the challenge is that our stories have stickiness in them and we're kind of committed to how we've seen them right now. But if you write it from the third person, say you've had a, say somebody's had an experience with a sibling that's been really tough or painful. If I wrote that story, but from the perspective of my sibling, or from the perspective of something else in the room, I don't care what it is, the teapot, the lamp, the rug, the, I, write it from a different perspective so you can get a different perspective on it. Let me take you back to something else you said. You said, when you know your story, you can trust yourself. Why is that important? Because if I know where my triggers are, you know, most of the time, so we'll go back to that example of people are sitting in a gathering and they all have a different response to it. If somebody gets triggered, usually that's pinging on my story somewhere because my story has mm -hmm. helped to shape what my values are. A lot of conflicts are values conflicts and we don't know that they're there and we can't express them because they're below the surface. I might get terribly annoyed with somebody or attack back. Why am I doing that? Because I'm triggered. So the more I know what my own triggers are, the more I've done my practice to keep staying present and curious, the more helpful I can be to myself and anybody else in any situation. Okay. So that is absolutely true. And I can share a personal story. There's one of my siblings. She has a whole handful of triggers of various things, and sometimes she doesn't understand them. But um, there have been many cases where we'd be in a conversation or someone else would be involved and her triggers would hit and she'd respond in a certain way. And mm -hmm. me or other people in the room are kind of like, what? just happened because no, you know, to everybody else, nothing had really, you know, nothing was on fire, but to her, she had just lit up and, um, and that's happened pretty regularly. And so I, I can see in that case, as she becomes aware of what those triggers are, or even as she notices herself doing that, she can stop. And she does, she's very self-aware. She'll stop and say, why did I react like that? And then in, in Ooh, getting to know and understand more about that. And we can all do that. You know, when we get triggered with something, stop, go backwards, say, why does that really bother me so much? And then if needed, engage in conversation with the other party about why that had been a difficult thing for you, yeah, which I think yeah. is a, a really key tool in, in just relationship propagation, right? Like being able to work through things in any type of relationship if something's triggered you. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the biggest question right now is how do we lean in instead of falling apart? Because there's so much that can trigger us. So what do I, what do I have to do to know enough about my own stories and build my resilience enough so that I can stay in something, even when it feels difficult, like the, the definition of difficult story is very simple, really. It's either a story that's hard to hear or hard to tell, but there are plenty of them out there. And we're in a moment right now in the world where trauma has been triggered a lot. It's a, it's a key thing that's up at the moment because of the pandemic. So people are much more right in their triggers than ever before. Let so me clarify. A, what, what do you mean by lean in? Uh, how do I, you know, like, Oh, I'm just about to hear something I think is going to be really uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. instead of going right, I'm not, I'm mm. not up for discomfort and, and walking out of the room. How do I actually stay present enough and curious enough that yes. I can go, not okay. what the hell just happened, but wow, what happened? Okay, staying curious and, and not yeah. reactive. Yeah, okay. so you know, there's that, it's that little minuscule, it's probably like a second worth in the brain between when this the thing happens and you allow yourself yes. to react, yes. right? Yes. So this bit of personal practice is about how do I make that gap just a tiny bit bigger so that I have a chance not to react, but to create. There's Absolutely. the same the same letters in react and create is just in a different order. <laughs> well, and isn't that one of the best, most advanced skills we as humans can learn because then we can act yeah. rather than react. And that's huge. No yes. matter what situation you're in. Yes. Um, okay. So and we're just about out of time here, but I wanted to talk about your book for a second. So you have written this revolutionary field guide to unleashing your inner superpower of story and that it has to do with exercises every day, right? So it's called Alive 365 or 365 Alive? 365 Alive. Actually, it's, it's a 52-week guide. So I, I realized I had enough material to do every day and I didn't want to be having people drinking out of a fire hose. That would be possible. <laughs> so it gives you a different prompt every week. It gives you a, a picture and a quote. 
And then I talk a little bit about what's inside of that. So that's the uh, think about piece. And then there's the take action piece. And that that's things like write your fairy tale, uh, look around you and see what stories are, are uh, happening and, and go after them. What if this is true? What's underneath this? Why are people doing that? And then there's a little piece called have a look. So I give TED talks and books and films and movies and stuff for people to explore the topic a bit more. And you can either work through it week by week. And there's some people who have done that. Or you can dip and dive in there. And I've also had people tell me, I just opened the book and it was the perfect thing for me right in the moment. I love that. I love that there's a field guide, that there's a way to guide you along. Humans work so much better with that, with direction, with, Mm -hmm. you know, we're we're talking about a concept here, but after this episode is over and they switch it off, you know, are you going to think about it again? Are you really going to do some work on your own story? And her book allows you to do that. So um, how can we find your book? It's on Amazon, both as a paperback and as a Kindle version. Uh, you can find it on um, Ingram Spark and what's the other one? Book Depository. So that one's a one that sends books all over the world. Okay, and if you buy it hardcover or even online with Kindle, it's full color, right? Like you've got mm. all of these beautiful thought pages with graphics and and things to think about every day. It's quite lovely. The other thing that's interesting about it, the designer I worked with, she's the kind of person who likes writing the margins of books. So she was arguing for the margins have to be big enough so people can write. I'm the person like, don't write in my book. But I went, (laughs) yeah, okay, I get it. Everybody should be able to really work with this in the way they need to. Especially since it's a workbook. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted it to be beautiful. Yeah, so it It, is. It is beautiful. Yes. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I want to open the the mic to you one final time for, do do you feel like there's something that needs to be said that hasn't been said? Yeah, this is the time for each of us to take some responsibility because stories are like seeds, you know, every time you share a story, you're tossing a seed out there. So, you know, there's some stories we should stop telling because they're not helping us. There's some stories we should keep telling because they're really supporting us to have a more generative future together and be better human beings. And there's some stories we should start telling. And I just want to encourage everybody who's listening to realize you have the power of all three of those things. You have the power to help us make a better future story. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and all you've shared. Thank you. We've already had a lot to think about in this episode, so I'll just end with the challenge. Get clear on your own story. Pinpoint one area of your life, just one of the many hundreds of stories, one area of your life that isn't working for you as well as you'd like. And take an honest look at those stories, maybe using some of the exercise ideas that Mary Alice gave us today. Look at what you're telling yourself. Consider the stories that others are creating for you by the way that they interpret things and if you keeping those stories is helping you. And then look at how how could you maybe shift one of those stories that would support you better? Look at it from a different angle or focus on what was learned instead of the negative emotion that was involved in it. Consider another perspective, like we talked about with the siblings, right? What would it look like to experiment with changes in the story, because you can just play with them and see, is there a story, an interpretation of that that's going to serve me better? I know that it's hard work, but we can do hard things. And these stories are important because they determine how our lives play out. There's so much writing on it. So like Harry Potter, learning to use his magic, sometimes the process is slow, but one step at a time, we make progress. Take a step this week. And I encourage you, if if you want guided help through this, absolutely get Mary Alice's book, 365 Alive. A A perfect book that you can pop in and out of to help you work through your stories. Thank you for being here. Share this episode with someone that it will bless and do a little good in the world by sharing the link of any of the podcast episodes that will bless people. We'll see you in two weeks for our next episode.